This is Dr. Robert C. Newman in his Synoptic Gospels course, lecture number 14 on form criticism. Well, good morning. We come to our last session here in Synoptic Gospel course. Uh, we've looked so far at the historical Jesus, the Jewish background, uh, introduction to exegesis, and the narrative genre. Uh, authorship date characteristics of the synoptics, uh, uh, exegeting parables, <clears throat> the Gospels as literary works, the synoptic problem, the geography of Palestine and Jerusalem, uh, exegeting miracle accounts, the theology of the synoptics, uh, controversy accounts, exegeting controversy accounts, and now we want to look at form criticism and redaction criticism. We'll also uh, want to uh, finish up with some conclusions on gospel history. <clears throat> well, we think a little about the terminology of form criticism. What is uh, <clears throat> the word form criticism about? <clears throat> it's a rough English translation of uh, two German terms, a uh, form Geschichte, uh, form history, or Gottumsforschung, uh, genre research. Form criticism is a method of analyzing materials that have been orally transmitted uh, <clears throat> in an attempt to recover their original versions on the assumption that their literary forms can be identified and restored to their primitive conditions. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to clarify this in a little bit here. The idea is that stories or sayings circulate orally, and as they do that, their content and complexity uh, changes in prediction, uh, predictable ways. <clears throat> uh, somewhat like the stories about the fish that got away that always seems to get bigger as the story uh, is repeated over and over. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the application of form criticism to the New Testament begins with Rudolf Bultmann just after World War I. What we want to do, first of all, is look a little bit at the background of form criticism, and then we'll come back and begin to describe it specifically. This approach of form criticism did not suddenly appear with Boltmann, but has a lengthy background in biblical studies. Several strands of liberal thought uh, were united in form criticism. <clears throat> first of all, uh, F.C. Bauer's Reconstruction of Church History. Bauer was a, uh, a German church history professor in the mid-19th century, mid-1800s. Uh, Bauer adopted Hegel's philosophy of history and applied it to church history. <clears throat> At this time, uh, Hegel's philosophy, uh, history as the conflict of ideas, was very influential in Europe. He saw all history as a conflict between a new idea, which he called the thesis, uh, which spawned a counter-idea, the antithesis. Their conflict led eventually uh, to some compromise idea which he called the synthesis. So a thesis conflict with the antithesis leading to the synthesis. Most people are more familiar with how Karl Marx uh, applied this idea to the struggle between social classes. <clears throat> uh, Bauer was the first to apply these ideas to early church history. He saw a struggle between two groups in the early church, characterized as follows. On the one hand, the Jewish church. On the other hand, the Gentile church. Paul's the leader of the Jewish church. Uh, excuse me, Peter is the Jewish, uh, leader of the Jewish church. Paul, the leader of the Gentile church. Jewish church made up mostly Jews. Gentile church, mostly Hellenistic Gentiles. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, a Jewish church saw Jesus as a great miracle-working man and Messiah. The Gentile church saw Jesus as God in a new mystery religion. <clears throat> the Jewish church had an emphasis on the law, the Gentile church an emphasis on the sacraments. The Jewish church an emphasis on national salvation, salvation of Israel, Gentile church on individual salvation. <clears throat> uh, Boltmann then later in the uh, <clears throat> 20th century uses uh, Bauer's ideas of two separate early and Jewish and Gentile churches to date the sources that he claims to find in the uh, uh, gospel material. <clears throat> so that's the first element, if you like, that uh, uh, will be used by Boltmann in his form criticism. The second was uh, uh, David Friedrich Strauss's uh, mythical approach. Uh, Strauss, you remember, wrote the Laban Yesu back in uh, 1835, 
and he said that much of the gospel was mythical, especially the miraculous. The gospels, he thought, are propaganda pieces which teach religious truth, but the events they narrate did not really happen. Form critics, especially Boltmann, follow Strauss in seeing much in the gospels as myth also. Uh, then we have a third uh, element, uh, Bernard Weiss and H.J. Holtzman's documentary theory. Uh, when we talked about synoptic problem, we mentioned the two-document theory. Uh, that was popularized by Weiss and Holtzman, and uh, yeah, although Eichhorn had proposed it earlier. <clears throat> Here, Mark and Q are the sources used by Matthew and Luke. Form criticism sees Mark and Q as the literary sources behind the Gospels, but then tries to go back behind Mark and Q to the original primitive oral materials. <clears throat> A fourth element is old liberal arguments over the character of Jesus. As we had said earlier, with miracles removed from the Gospels, we have uh, conflicting pictures of Jesus. Uh, some see him as a moral teacher, others as a revolutionary leader, or a prophet of eschatological doom, or a charlatan. And uh, which parts of the gospel material are selected or rejected affects which type of Jesus uh, these various different guys see. Boltmann and others hoped that form criticism could clarify the picture and get back to the real historical Jesus. A fifth element behind form criticism is Vreda and uh, Velhausen's skepticism. Freda and Velhausen uh, proposed that even Mark and Q were theological constructs derived from the interpretation of the early church. And so, if that's true, then we have to dissolve the framework uh, of these uh, narratives and look at the isolated basic sayings. And this is what form criticism does. But form criticism got started first in the Old Testament, and so that's a kind of the sixth element. And this brings us to Hermann Gunkel. Uh, he distinguished small units in Genesis and in the Psalms, which he claimed had once circulated orally before being written down. <clears throat> the units in Genesis, he said, contain legends designed to explain the origin of names, whether places or uh, people. Uh, <clears throat> the units in the Psalms uh, were worship or liturgical materials prepared for specific occasions or specific shrines. Uh, Gunkel tried to reconstruct the life situation, which comes to be known in German as a Sitzungleben, uh, in which these stories or psalms originated. Well, Boltmann then tries to do the same for the units he finds in the Synoptic Gospels. That brings us then finally to form criticism in the New Testament. After World War I, uh, Boltmann applied Gunkel's method to the Gospels, that is, to the pieces isolated from the framework of uh, Mark and Q, as suggested by Vreda and Velhausen. Uh, Boltmann claimed this material, uh, this, this, his method, form criticism, could distinguish earlier material from later material, could distinguish Gentile from Jewish sources, and could thus determine which materials really went back to Jesus. Boltmann's methods have been refined since his time, uh, they find their most avid practitioners in the uh, members of the Jesus Seminar mentioned back in our discussion of the historical Jesus. So, uh, that much then on uh, kind of the background of form criticism. Methods of form criticism. Well, a first question to ask, I suppose, is what is a form? Uh, well, <clears throat> to understand form criticism, we start with the basics. There are all sorts of things that are called forms, and a uh, number of these have some relation to our concern here. <clears throat> a form is a sort of mold which gives shape to some medium. Uh, for instance, we have uh, concrete forms for pour ma pouring concrete into uh, to make uh, sidewalks and gutters and uh, uh, things of that sort. <clears throat> we have jello molds for making uh, jello salads and some other things of that sort. <clears throat> we might call these physical forms. Uh, by analogy, then we also have language forms, and language forms also give a shape to some medium, but the medium here is language. Uh, these forms uh, hold certain words fixed, which are then the form, and then vary other words, which we might think are the contents we pour into the form. Uh, <clears throat> and so that makes these forms useful for a variety of applications. <clears throat> Uh, we still uh, think about this rather in rather common use uh, when we talk about filling out a form. 
So you've got an application form, and it's uh, set up for an application for a job or for college or something. And it's got certain forms, things fixed, name, address, etc., and what those are depends on whether what kind of a form it is. Uh -huh. Uh, <clears throat> some examples uh, that uh, perhaps are not called form so much, a polite introduction is a form. Uh, you have uh, kind of the space for a person's name, and then I would like you to meet, and then you put another person's name in there. So uh, that uh, tells you uh, politely how you uh, go about introducing somebody. A sermon uh, is also, if you like, a, uh, a literary form or a uh, verbal form. <clears throat> It can have somewhat different uh, shapes, if you like, forms, if you like, depending on whether it's a textual sermon, a topical sermon, or an expository sermon. <clears throat> the classical sermon form consists of an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. And the body, especially for a classical sermon, should make three points and should be sprinkled with illustrations and exhortations. The conclusion might well end in a poem or a prayer or an altar call, depending on the particular Christian denominational background for, uh, uh, in which the sermon is being given. <clears throat> a good test for recognizing a form is, can it be mimicked or parodied? Uh, for instance, a textual sermon on Mary Had a Little Lamb, which I've heard on a few occasions is an example of that sort of thing. <clears throat> we also get uh, legal or financial forms. A check, for instance, if you pull out your checkbook and look at it, has got uh, fixed words and a lot of blanks, and it's basically a little short memo or letter to your, uh, your bank, and it's dated uh, so that uh, uh, <clears throat> the bank can see whether it's uh, been around a long time or not. And it tells uh, who you pay the check to and how much, and it's got two places for that to keep the recipient from kiting the check, from sticking in some extra numbers to make it a bigger amount. And then it's got your signature, and uh, recent checks have, of course, name of the bank and all sorts of routing numbers down at the bottom and things of that sort as well. A deed or a will would also be examples of legal forms. <clears throat> In English, we have literary forms of, uh, uh, in poetry, a sonnet, for instance, uh, is fixed as being 14 lines, and it's supposed to be in a particular meteor, uh, medium, uh, yeah, meter called iambic pentameter, and uh, it's lyric, it's about some uh, uh, a topic like love or, uh, or beauty of nature, something of that sort, and often has a fixed rhyme scheme. So uh, here's a, uh, a Christian sonnet by Francis Ridley Havergal, uh, a, a fairly well-known uh, hymn writer from the uh, 19th century. Uh, Love culminates in bliss when it doth reach a white, unflickering, fear-consuming glow. And knowing it is known as it doth know, needs no assuring word or soothing speech. It craves but silent nearness, so to rest. No sound, no movement, love not heard but felt longer and longer still till time should melt a snowflake on the eternal ocean's breast have moments of this silence uh, starred thy past made memory a glory haunted place taught all the joy that mortal kin can trace by greater light tis but a shadow cast so shall the lord thy god rejoice over thee and in his love will rest and silent be on the other end of the spectrum, we have limericks, a five-line humorous poem. Three lines, first, second, and fifth, have three feet to their meter, and they rhyme. And uh, two lines, a third and a fourth, are shorter, two feet, and they rhyme. And the fifth line is the punchline. There was a young lady named Bright who traveled much faster than light. She set out one day in a relative way and returned on the previous night. <clears throat> One of my students wrote this limerick. <clears throat> <clears throat> there was a professor named Newman who was known for his wit and acumen. He gave out a test, <clears throat> but everyone guessed, so he flunked them without even fuming. Okay. This was by John Bloom, one of my former students. <clears throat> well, those are examples of uh, literary forms, if you like. Uh, let's take a look at the assertions that Boltmann and other form critics make. Uh, they say, uh, yeah, okay, there are forms in written and oral literature, so what does Boltmann claim we can do with them? 
Here are the typical assertions of Boltman-type form critics. Some form critics are more conservative than he is, but Boltman has had by far the greatest influence in New Testament studies. So, Boltman and others of that sort assert, one, there was a period of oral tradition before the Gospels were written. And uh, uh, most people would agree that something oral was around for a while. Boltman argues for two generations of oral transmission, from Christ to perhaps 70 to 100 A.D. Secondly, during that time of oral transmission, gospel sayings and narratives circulated as independent units. And then thirdly, these units may be classified by their form into groups. Uh, typically three groups, some will have more, and you can obviously subdivide the groups. Uh, one of these groups is a saying, an isolated statement of Jesus, with no narrative supporting it. Another is a saying story, a proverb or sharp pithy saying uh, with a story around it that helps you understand the point of it, or uh, uh, helps you see the punchline or something of that sort. And thirdly, a miracle story, a narrative of a miraculous event. Fourthly, uh, Boltman and others claim that the early church not only preserved but also invented many of these units to fill practical needs. And so by knowing the emphasis of each unit, we can determine its source and show that many of these do not go back to Jesus. So uh, uh, one of these is that the Palestinian or Jewish church saw Jesus as its Messiah and expected his return as the Son of Man. So that kind of material would point to a, a Jewish church background. The Hellenistic Gentile church, on the other hand, saw Jesus as cult lord or deity of their new mystery religion and emphasized their present communion with the Holy Spirit. So uh, the early church preserved and invented many of these. Uh, fifth, these materials have little or no real biographical, chronological, or geographical value. Uh, the extent to which they've got those is not really, uh, what shall we say, uh, authentic. So what do they tell you in these areas? This was added later in the oral tradition or made up by Mark to fit his framework or such. <clears throat> uh, Boltman and such would point out that this tendency is seen in folklore. So as uh, we think, uh, stories about George Washington are embellished with unhistorical details, like his throwing a dollar across the Potomac River or something of that sort. <clears throat> Note the implication here that the early church was sloppy with the truth and used their stories for propaganda purposes. Fifth, the original version of each tradition unit may be recovered and its oral history uh, traced by using the laws which govern tradition. <clears throat> well, what are these laws? Uh, they're derived from observing how stories, etc., develop. <clears throat> for instance, the traditions in Greek and Jewish literature, uh, the letter of Aristius, for instance, traces the origin of the uh, Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. And as you uh, hear the story of the uh, origin of the Septuagint in later writers, it tends to get embellished in various ways, as reported by, say, Philo or Josephus or the Church Fathers or others. <clears throat> or you can see how it develops in parables in Talmudic and other Jewish religious li literature where you often see several versions of the same parable in the different, in the different uh, uh, rabbinic literature. Or the apocryphal gospels as they borrow from the canonical gospels. Or the canonical gospels, Matthew and Luke, as they borrow from Mark and Q. So uh, these would be the places that uh, Boltman and others would use to uh, try and develop their laws of how uh, tradition uh, changes the content of various uh, oral uh, statements. Huh? <clears throat> well, uh, that's uh, kind of the uh, assumptions of uh, uh, form criticism. And then we look a little bit at their procedure. Uh, using these assertions, form critics process each unit to get its most primitive form and then try to decide whether that uh, unit goes back to Jesus or not. So their first step is to isolate the stories and sayings from the context, which is assumed to be a purely editorial invention. So uh, they assume that Matthew and Luke both use Mark, and so they then uh, basically try and take out these anecdotes, if you like, or these sayings, and if necessary, shave them down some to uh, get back to the original form. To do this, they use the laws of tradition to recover, uh, recover the original or primitive state of each story or saying. And uh, for that, a primitive narrative is said to be characterized by a single scene, a short time period, only two or three characters, 
and any groups who are present act as a unit. And in fact, we do often see these things. They're features of storytelling, okay? Uh, and whether those stories are, are historical stories or not, uh, to uh, convey something, uh, what shall we say, in an understandable, interesting way, those are common features, if you like. A development of a narrative then involves, according to Boltmann and others, increasing elaboration and making details more explicit, uh, adding names where none were originally converting indirect discourse to direct discourse, adding miraculous elements. So basically these are applied to try and get back to the most primitive form for each uh, saying or saying story or miracle story. <clears throat> and then, uh, <clears throat> uh, fifthly, uh, thirdly, excuse me, uh, you try to decide uh, which early group was responsible for this primitive form. Possibilities, early church, Jewish or Gentile, the Jews, or Jesus, right? just like as we said before, uh, you know, Martin Luther was uh, came out of the Catholic Church and started Lutheranism. So uh, Jesus comes out of Judaism and starts Christianity. So uh, so these other uh, possible groups are all considered candidates. What kind of criteria would be used uh, to try and decide whether they go back to Jesus or not? Uh, one of them is multiple attestation. If a form appears in both Mark and Q, then it's more likely to go back to Jesus. And dissonance. <clears throat> uh, Jesus actually said those things which we cannot imagine any other early source would say. For instance, paying taxes to Caesar. Uh, the Jews didn't like paying taxes. Christians didn't like paying taxes. So it must go back to Jesus. Well, that's uh, basically uh, what we've got here. <clears throat> Well, we look at some uh, samples then of the application of form criticism. <clears throat> uh, first of all, we'll go back and talk a little bit about these basic forms uh, that we've identified. Uh, typically, three basic forms identified in the gospel material, though some critics have more. Notice the category of sayings has numerous sub-varieties. Miracle stories. Form critics find the following structure to uh, miracle stories. The problem is described, some sickness of a person or a danger or necessity, uh, something of that sort, uh, danger, the boat's about to sink, necessity, these people are out here in the wilderness and uh, uh, they might not even make it back to towns uh, when their blood sugar gets too low or something we might say. <clears throat> the problem is solved uh, by the actions of the healer or whatever, and Boltmann does uh, remark that the uh, actions of Jesus as a healer are very reserved. Uh, compared with uh, uh, some of the actions the healers in uh, uh, Josephus or uh, rabbinic uh, materials or uh, magical papyri or uh, apocryphal gospels or things of that sort. <clears throat> and then the effect of the miracle is stated. Uh, the person healed, his reaction, her reaction, uh, the reactions the crowd, the reactions the demon, things of that sort. <clears throat> we walk through a couple examples here just to give you a little feeling. Mark 1. 23 to 27, demon-possessed man in the synagogue. There's some con uh, con yeah, contextual connection uh, at the beginning of the story, just then, etc. And critics say, uh, well, that's the work of the editor, okay. That's the way he connects this uh, anecdote into the uh, narrative, so that you throw that out. <clears throat> but you've got the problem. The man is possessed by a demon. You've got the solution. Jesus speaks and heals the man. And Boltmann notes that I said that in comparison with the Apocrypha and the Greek miracle stories, there's great simplicity in Jesus' healings. No magic words or ritual, though occasionally they point to ephatha as being some sort of a magic word, although it's just basically Aramaic for open, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and admittedly, uh, uh, <clears throat> some of the demon uh, uh, exorcisms uh, that you see elsewhere. I think of the one in Josephus, where Josephus tells us about, a, uh, I think it was an Essene, that had a ring with some herbs inside it from that were specified in one of Solomon's magical books. And he takes the ring and he holds it up to the nose of the fellow and he pulls it. And the demon comes out and the demon overturns a wash basin of water over here so that you know that he's come out, etc. So, uh, <clears throat> well, the effect in this particular one we're looking at, the man possessed by the demon, Jesus speaks and heals the man, and then you have the reaction of the crowd, the demon, and the healed person in this particular case. Or Mark 4, 35 to 41, Jesus rebuking the wind and the waves. Context, on that day, throw it out, okay? 
problem, the boat's sinking, and you've got high winds. A solution, Jesus rebukes the wind, rather reserved action. Uh, effect, calm. Disciples are amazed. <clears throat> Both these examples fit Boltmann's primitive miracle story form. Single scene, few actors, crowd acting as unit, etc. Well, miracle stories actually do have this basic form. Right? We see that already in when we talked about miracle accounts back in our Exegeting a Miracle account, and when we uh, uh, looked at Leland Ryken's uh, uh, characterization of a bunch of different kinds of narratives in the Synoptic Gospels. <clears throat> uh, they do have basic form, but that does not mean you can call them primitive or, development, or developed. It's a natural way to narrate something of this sort and would apply to any problem-solution anecdote, if you like. Saying stories. <clears throat> a saying story is a narrative with a saying as its central feature. The narrative is constructed to illuminate the meaning or impact of the saying. Some general character characteristics of New Testament saying stories. <clears throat> uh, some of these suitably modified would also apply to secular and modern uh, forms as well. Uh, first, the emphasis is on a saying of Jesus or of one approved by him. Or in the rabbinic literature, uh, emphasis on something that Hillel said or something Shammai said or Akiba said, something like that. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> the brief, simple narrative is just sufficient to make the saying comprehensible. Uh, you often have somebody that uh, tells some story and then it says, you had to be there, okay? Uh, in other words, he didn't tell the story very well. That's basically what that means. If you, if you tell it well, the person can, uh, can catch the point. <clears throat> and then, uh, thirdly, the story contains some biographical interest. Uh, but Boltman would say, uh, this is only biographical interest uh, regarding what people thought Jesus was like. Uh, uh, Boltman claims that these don't have any real historical value as they're not accurate. Uh, the post boltmanians as we saw earlier, disagree with this, uh, saying that uh, if there's multiple attestation and dissonance and such, uh, then biographical features may go back to the historical Jesus and have some value. And lastly, the story is rounded off by saying or an act of Jesus. Sometimes saying is back in the middle, and the act, like Jesus healed the guy or something, is at the end, but more frequently rounded off by the saying. <clears throat> this functions to get in and out of the story nicely, it usually ends with the saying itself or with an act of Jesus. Uh, one of the things you notice when you uh, uh, listen to uh, uh, people who are uh, not uh, skilled or experienced storytellers is they have a hard time uh, stopping, okay? They don't know how to get out of the, uh, the story they're telling in a satisfactory way. <clears throat> well, let's look at some examples of uh, uh, <clears throat> saying stories. Mark 3, verses 2 through 6, the man with the withered hand healed. Uh, this is not primitive as we see a combination of miracle and saying story here, but since the emphasis on the saying, uh, the miracle is the scene which illuminates the saying. It needs some simplification probably to be a primitive uh, form according to form criticism. Context, uh, the Pharisees are watching Jesus. The question, uh, He's got this fellow there with the uh, a withered hand. Uh, will Jesus heal? The response, Jesus says, is it lawful to heal on, uh, on the Sabbath? And Jesus' healing miracle answers the question. Biographical interest, uh, Jesus' anger, Jesus' concern for the sick man. Rounding off, either the healing itself or when the Pharisees leave rather angry. <clears throat> Another example of the same story, uh, Mark 2, 23-28, picking grain on the Sabbath. Here, uh, Jesus answers their question with a question, and he rounds off the story with, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Biographical interest, Jesus' compassion for his disciples, etc. We have many cases uh, where Jesus responds with a parable. <clears throat> Question, who is my neighbor? Answer, parable of the Good Samaritan, etc. <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> first of these uh, categories then is called Jewish saying stories, <clears throat> and these are similar to those in rabbinic literature. Somebody, an enemy, king, disciple, person in the crowd, asks Jesus a question, and uh, uh, 
ask, or ask the rabbi a question, excuse me, and the rabbi's characteristic answer is a parable or another question. And naturally, this type would be older, but not necessarily from Jesus. And those two examples we gave you, the man with the withered hand and picking grain on the Sabbath, fall in that category. But uh, Boltman also sees uh, Greek saying stories, <clears throat> and this is a much less definite form. Uh, the form is basically introduced by a stereotype formula. When he, uh, the Greek philosopher or teacher or something, was asked by someone about something he said. Uh, there's no really story or background with it. Uh, this is the way anecdotes the various Greek philosophers were typically preserved. Well, there's one classic New Testament example of this. It's in Luke 17, 20 through 21, which uses this formula above. Mm. Uh, in the NASU, uh, now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. <clears throat> As the Greek saying stories are obviously uh, 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 <clears throat> later editions showing a Greek influence, Boltmann throws them out. <clears throat> According to Boltmann, Jewish saying stories may have Jesus or the early Jewish church or the pre-Christian Jews as sources, but Greek saying stories have Gentile uh, church as source. So that's the second category. First, miracle stories. Second, saying stories. Third, sayings, or what we might say, isolated sayings. Uh, sayings that originally had no story with them, as the saying stories did. Uh, some of these may now be grouped together to form sermons. Others may be part of a saying story now, but their original form was isolated. And some of them still isolated here. How do we know if a sermon or story is the editor's invention? Uh, why remove the story in one case and not in another? Form critics say that if the saying makes no sense without the story, then it's a saying story, not a simple saying. But if it makes sense without it, it may be, have been originally just a simple saying. Boltmann finds five kinds of sayings in the uh, Gospels. Uh, proverbs, <coughs> which Boltmann calls logia, but uh, the t n term that has been uh, fastened upon by uh, uh, form critics and is more uh, understandable to the average person as proverbs. These are like uh, uh, the proverbs in the Old Testament books of proverbs or somewhat like uh, Benjamin Franklin's uh, proverbs in Poor Richard's Almanac, a short pithy saying of some sort, the first shall be last and the last first, or physician, heal yourself. <clears throat> a second category is prophetic or apocalyptic sayings. These are sayings about the future especially about the end of the age. Not one stone will be left upon another. Two will be grinding in a mill, one will be taken and one left, etc. A third category is law words or commandments, uh, sayings structured as commands or imperatives. Turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. Uh, a fourth category is I words, where Jesus uses I in the saying. He's referring to himself. Uh, these focus on the person and authority of Jesus. Uh, you have heard that have said, but I say unto you, etc. would be examples from the Sermon on the Mount. And lastly, parables. Uh, <clears throat> metaphorical sayings, often in story form, uh, without the meaning embedded in the narrative. Boltwong was very much influenced here by Adolf Ulicker, uh, who claimed that authentic parables make only a single comparison, have only one point, and are never allegorical. The parable of the sower, uh, they would say might be authentic, but the interpretation is not, because every item has an assigned meaning, that is, it makes the parable into an allegory. This is too complicated to be a primitive form. The parable of the wedding feast, uh, which uh, we looked at earlier, you remember where the guests are invited and a bunch of them turn it down and they go out and get some more, and then after the, uh, they're in there, this guy shows up that doesn't have a wedding uh, garment on, etc. <clears throat> parable of wedding feast has two parts to it, the wedding invitation section and the wedding garment section. These were originally two parables combined by the editor of Matthew 22. The king's wedding feast, Matthew 22, is a revised version of the earlier rich man's banquet of Luke 14. The wars, the son, and the king added later. Authentic parables of Jesus are related to the ministry of Jesus or to the coming of the kingdom, so Boltman would throw any others out that have uh, some other topic. 
Well, that's kind of a quick tour of how Boltmond does form criticism without going, you know, one by one through uh, all the different sayings, etc. Uh, results for the life of Christ, according to Boltmond. Uh, the results uh, uh, by various form critics will uh, vary considerably, uh, depending on where the form critic falls on the liberal conservative spectrum, uh, but Boltmond is near the extreme liberal end. Miracle stories. Even after reducing them to their primitive form, Boltmann concludes that these are not genuine. Why? Since his worldview does not allow miracles to occur. See his uh, discussion and evidence of faith, pages 291 and following. <clears throat> it's a big assumption. Uh, <clears throat> he could have uh, tried to explain them as misunderstood natural events, but apparently did not want to be ridiculed like Paulus was. Saying stories. Only two are genuine, that is, go back to Jesus, according to Boltmann. Boltmann threw out using dissonance argument all that could fit a Jewish or Christian background. You remember what we said about Martin Luther in that regard. <clears throat> this is a rather strange uh, methodology. If we threw out everything of Luther's which also fit Catholicism or early Lutheranism, we would hardly have anything left. <clears throat> perhaps his bondage to will, but even this has precedence in Augustinianism. <clears throat> Unless a person has no followers, we would expect to find parallels between his teaching and those of his followers. And unless he is very strange, we would expect to find parallels between his teaching and that of his culture. The two saying stories which Boltmann uh, admits are Mark 12, 13 through 17, the tribute money, and his argument for authenticity is that neither the Jews or persecuted Christians like paying taxes. <clears throat> Rebuttal. Maybe the source of the story was Herodians or Zealots, depending on whether Jesus is seen as speaking seriously or ironically. <clears throat> Mark 14, 3 through 9, the anointing at Bethany. Argument for authenticity, allowing perfume to be poured out. Uh, 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 is uh, uh, <clears throat> strange uh, given the uh, uh, <clears throat> interest in both Christians and Jews in uh, helping the poor, and the poor always with you idea was also thought to be strange. So uh, not scolding at a waste of money is unique, and so Wolfman thought that that was authentic. We move over to the isolated sayings. Wolfman sees only about 40 of these as genuine, the Proverbs, he says, none are genuine. Okay, The early Christians were not interested in the life of Christ until about 70 or 80 AD. They then adapted Jewish Proverbs already in existence to provide materials to manufacture Jesus' teaching. Okay? You need to have him say something. <clears throat> Two, apocalyptic sayings. Some are from Jesus. Others are Christianized Jewish apocalyptic sayings or sayings by Christian prophets later ascribed to Jesus. Boltmann and a number of form critics view early Christianity as being like the modern Pentecostal movement, which is not a compliment in their view. <clears throat> Basically, prophetic messages uh, by various prophets standing up in congregations were later misattributed to Jesus. It's basically what Boltmann claims. Law words. A few of these are from Jesus. Uh, most stem from the legalism of the early church and were invented by them, and Jesus was not a legalist, uh, as Boltmann thinks, so only the commands against externalistic religion are likely to be authentic as they go back uh, against, as they go against legalism. <clears throat> I words. <clears throat> None of those are from Jesus, according to Boltmann. These speak of his messianic ministry and his deity. Thus, Boltmann rejects them. The Messiah idea, he thinks, was invented by the early church, uh, rather as Freda uh, in his Messianic secret theory. Parables. Some are genuine. <clears throat> However, their context and interpretations are later inventions of the church. All predictive features are obviously late additions. Well, the results for this then. Uh, information on the personality and life of Jesus are rather scarce. Uh, Boltmann thinks Jesus lived, suffered, and died, which, by the way, is more than some of your communist uh, uh, arguments uh, would be willing to grant. <clears throat> Boltmann believes some people followed Jesus, but they misunderstood him if they thought he was the Messiah, much less if they thought he was Savior or God. 
uh, further results, information on the teaching of Jesus is somewhat clearer. From the 40 genuine sayings of Jesus, uh, Boltmann thinks we can deduce some ideas. Uh, he says, first of all, Jesus thought of himself as a prophet sent in the last hour to warn men that the kingdom was coming and to call them to repentance and to lives of holiness. And these points are all true, but Boltmann has scaled down considerably what Jesus claims and teaches. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, Boltmann thinks Jesus pictures the coming kingdom as real and imminent, but he was wrong. Okay, uh, This is in fact a very common liberal view that Jesus and the apostles expected the kingdom to come during their lifetimes. <clears throat> Boltmann and others feel justified by the events as the kingdom uh, did not and has not come, although it's of some interest to compare uh, this with 2 Peter 3.3. 3 where uh, Peter says, know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it has from the beginning of creation. Boltman sees the real value of Jesus' teaching is the fact that each of us is always faced with the existential choice to live at every moment either for God or for the world. Boltmann sees the only value of Jesus teaching in our everyday life as this. <clears throat> there is no afterlife and there is no future judgment. This everyday value is real and present in Jesus teaching, but it is only a small fraction of his teaching. Okay, well that's a very quick tour of form criticism uh, and seen largely in terms of Boltmann, but who is uh, the most influential of those. We come back now and think in terms of an evaluation of form criticism. What are we to think of form criticism? I'll uh, start the evaluation first of all in terms of the assertions that were made back earlier, the assertions of form criticism. So the first of these, there was a period of oral tradition before the written Gospels. It extended some two generations and the first Gospels were written in the span 70 to 100 AD. Well, there was an oral period since the Gospels themselves were not written immediately, but this only lasted uh, perhaps 20 years until 40 or 50 AD, uh, not the 40 to 70 years that the liberals claim. After only 20 years, <clears throat> there were still many eyewitnesses alive since early events uh, were seen uh, by uh, thousands. Uh, thus, before about 70 AD, there were many around for verification. After Jerusalem fell, most Jewish Christians were scattered and many other eyewitnesses were dead. Paul writes as early as 20 years after the events, and none of his letters are over 35 years after Jesus' ministry. He had close contact with the apostles and uh, the Jerusalem church. <clears throat> early and pervasive tradition says that two Gospels were written by apostles and two others by their immediate associates. As a result, there's no real chain of tradition such as is essential to form criticism. In their scheme, you've got, uh, you know, uh, the event is here and observer A sees some things and he tells B and he tells C and C tells D, etc. until you get down here to Z or something and then it's written down. Long chain of tradition. Instead, all information in the Gospels was first or second hand with many witnesses, multiple testimony, and plenty of opportunity for checking. The uh, second uh, uh, assertion of form criticism is that early sayings and stories circulated as independent units. Well, <clears throat> we do in fact observe that the gospel structure is often like beads on a string. Not always, but often. Uh, detailed incidents are tied together with brief connectives. We saw some of those when we looked over some of the miracle accounts there, and just then, and things like that that are very brief connectors. Huh? Form criticism says the early church created most of the beads and nearly all the string to hold them together. Well, some of the gospel accounts probably were used as independent units in the sense that the apostles traveled around teaching who, what Jesus said and what he did and who he was, etc. And uh, uh, they would naturally use individual incidents to illustrate points and teach facts in their preaching. <clears throat> But these incidents never had an independent, isolated circulation in their transmission from event to written gospel. 
they may have well, perfectly well have had some independent isolated circulation that didn't involve that, but because the, uh, the gospel writers were apostles or, uh, or immediate hearers, uh, they never had this independent isolated circulation in that, in that link, if you like. <clears throat> Other teachers like the 70, uh, excuse me, the apostles knew the string as well as the beads, and other teachers like the 70 knew how the incense went together and this connecting information was never lost. If the traditional information, uh, authorship information is at all correct, independent circulation is of no relevance to the content of the canonical Gospels. Besides, uh, not all Gospel material looks like beads on a string. The Passion narrative is too tightly connected to have been independent anecdotes. <clears throat> Other stories are, all, are, are uh, always closely joined together the woman with the hemorrhage and Jairus' daughter is always interlinked even in the uh, accounts where that occurs. Uh, Mark has a tightly united Sabbath day sequence in Mark 1, 21 through 39. Some t uh, sayings are uh, tightly associated, as in uh, uh, Mark 4, 21 through 25, Mark 8, 4, uh, 8, 34 through 9, 1. We see places where the single author who put the units together was a moral and poetic genius. Uh, for example, the Sermon on the Mount has striking Hebrew parallelism and the poetic content. Its moral teaching is the best ever seen. See also the chiasms noticed by Kenneth Bailey in his Poet and Peasant and uh, the various remarks on the literary co uh, quality of the parables and sermons of Jesus in Leland Riken, uh, the New Testament in literary criticism. How do all these uh, uh, fragments made up by various early groups get woven into this material and uh, this uh, moral and literary tapestry. What genius did this? Jesus is the best suggestion, but in that case these units had only one source and were never independent. Thirdly, the gospel materials can be classified into forms. <clears throat> in some sense, any written or oral communication can be classified into forms. Uh, beyond this, the beads on the string structure of the Gospels allows many examples of relatively short, discrete forms, namely stories and sayings of various sorts. <clears throat> Yet the formal character of some of Boltmann's categories is questionable. Uh, questionable. Four of Boltmann's five saying categories, all but the parables, are merely descriptive of contents. What style distinguishes a law word or an I word from a proverb? Furthermore, the passion narrative has no form which it fits. How can you uh, reduce something this complex to a primitive form? And the dating of formless materials cannot be based on the development of forms. Boltmann has decided in advance, independent of true forms, which materials are authentic and which he can't believe. We see him throw at all miracle forms even when they have his true primitive form. Fourthly, the early church invented and expanded stories and sayings to meet their practical needs. Surely, one factor in the preservation of material about Jesus was its value to the early church, but this was not the only factor, and there was no need to propose invention. What do we mean by practical, anyway? Uh, note that Paul's epistles are far more practical than the Gospels in meeting the needs of functioning churches, as they are written to real churches having real problems. This is very obvious in the great preponderance of preaching from the epistles that we see in practically oriented churches today. Yet compared with Paul's teaching, it appears that many of the church's interests are not found in the Gospels and vice versa. The Gospels tell us who Jesus is and what he did, salvation history, biblical theology, but they do not answer many practical issues. Even the details of the practical applications of Jesus' atonement are found in the epistles rather than the Gospels, apparently because Jesus did not discuss this during his earthly ministry. That people were willing to follow Jesus, even follow him to their deaths, suggests that he must have done or said something noteworthy. Much of the material in the Gospels is not directly practical to later churches, but it's important historically, uh, his dealings with the Pharisees and such. The Gospels are concerned to preserve Jesus' ministry, his sayings, his actions, which is why the church preserved them. Are the Gospels invention? Many practical things in the Gospels are impossible. Sermon on the Mount contains much 
that people cannot do in their own abilities. Legalistic churches are careful not to invent commands that can only be obeyed by grace. When liberals say that gospel material was invented, uh, they are claiming that the early church did not control what was being taught about Jesus. But the New Testament is concerned about truth, about trained elders, and rejecting false teaching. Liberals try to dismiss much of this material, for example, the pastoral epistles, by pushing them uh, by pushing their date to the end of the first century. But if there was a group of church leaders who control church teaching and content from Christ's death until the Gospels were written, then liberals are in trouble. In that case, the Gospels are historically reliable, liberal theology is wrong, and there's a judgment to come. Fifth, the Gospels contain little of biographical, geographical, and chronological value. Well, the Gospels have lots of data in these areas. We cannot very well check it all out 2,000 years later. We don't have time machines. Certainly, Jesus is pictured as making huge claims regarding himself and the coming judgment. These implications continue to affect men. To deny these claims and the historical value of the Gospels, one must assert that the early church was not interested in the Jesus of history. This is contradicted everywhere. 1 Corinthians 15, about 25 years after the event, Paul says, If Christ is not raised, you are still in your sins. Paul does not say, Take my word for it, but appeals to many witnesses who are still living. So 25 years after the event, one could still check the details about the life of Christ. Luke 1, 1 through 4 explicitly says that the author had an interest in what really happened. He apparently interviewed eyewitnesses and investigated matters carefully. Acts 1, 21-22, when selecting a replacement for Judas, the apostles pick someone who has been with them from Christ's baptism to the resurrection. <clears throat> Thus the apostles were not only witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, but also of his ministry. This shows great interest in the history of Jesus. The early church was also concerned that this material be transmitted carefully. Uh, see the concern in 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, 2.15, 2.17, and 3.17 about fake messages and letters from Paul regarding the second coming. Paul says he personally signs his letters as proof of his authenticity. <clears throat> proof of their authenticity. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says to commit to faithful men what you have heard in the presence of many witnesses. So Timothy had more than just Paul's word to go on. Uh, we see a similar uh, statement, by the way, in the rabbinic literature, Mishnah Ediot 5.7, where Rabbi uh, uh, Kabya uh, ben Mahalel is on his deathbed around 90 AD. He tells his son to repeat only what he had heard from a majority of teachers. Ignore the tradition that comes from one only, even if it is father. To hold on to their position, form critics reject papias testimony regarding the close connection between the Gospels and Apostles though there is no external evidence against it. <clears throat> uh, we have, uh, obviously, Papias' testimony that the Apostle Matthew is behind the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, uh, Peter, uh, through Mark, is responsible for the Gospel of Mark. Liberals make the Apostle Matthew the author of Q at best, and say all other early references are based on misinterpretation of Papias. This is a big assumption. Uh, could Irenaeus be limited to Papias alone as his, date, as his data source when his primary teacher was Polycarp? <clears throat> Note that the Gnostics had to go to the plot theories in order to claim authority for their teachings. They agreed that the public teaching of Jesus was just as the canonical Gospels had it, but claimed it was incomplete and had to be supplemented with the secret words of Jesus. Compare the opening words of the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas, both of which make reference to secret teachings. All this shows that the church was interested in who Jesus really was and that their written documents were good. Marcion even modified Luke instead of throwing everything out as unreliable. <clears throat> Sixth, <clears throat> the original version of each tradition unit may be uncovered, uh, may be recovered, and its history traced by using the laws which govern tradition. Even if we grant that Boltmann's laws of tradition are valid, though in fact they have serious problems, this does not prove falsification occurred in the Gospels. Claims that during the transmission of tradition details tend to increase, names are added, discourse shifts from indirect to direct, do not fit, 
with Mark being the source of Matthew and Luke, uh, where uh, Mark has lots of direct discourse and uh, often more details than Matthew and Luke have. It is true that these tendencies frequently do characterize tr transmission of stories and sayings, as in fleshing out a sermon illustration, but even a tendency to do something does not prove it was done in a particular case. The problem is that for an event which really happened, the people did have real names. They really did speak with direct discourse, and the uh, events actually occurred in great detail. So all these things were in the original event. <clears throat> Given two narratives, uh, an event uh, of an event with different levels of detail, one less, one more, uh, you have to guess where which one is older. Here's the original event here with all the detail, and then it comes back down, and then eventually it gets very low, and then people begin to invent stuff. And does the long arrow belong over here with the short arrow behind it further away from the event? Or uh, does the short arrow belong here and the long arrow back over here? You don't know. Okay. <clears throat> Even if one grants some falsification in the Gospels, is there enough to completely throw out the teaching of the Last Judgment? Liberals must say that the Gospels are totally unreliable in order to do this. Could this have happened in one generation within a group that was obviously concerned about truth? One cannot throw out miracles, stories, on the basis of laws of tradition. This would resemble uh, uh, concluding from fish stories that fish do not exist. The laws of tradition only allow simplifying the stories, but not ruling them out altogether. Boltmann and liberals throw out miracles on the assumption that they cannot occur. Well, no scientist, much less Boltmann, knows enough to say that our universe is a closed system of cause and effect, into which even God cannot penetrate. Boltmann's procedure guarantees finding a non-miraculous, unorthodox Jesus, using the dissonance principle, but does it actually tell us anything? about the real Jesus. Well, some positive lessons from form criticism. <clears throat> First of all, uh, the gospel accounts contain just the sort of material we would expect in the authentic reminiscences of men who witnessed memorable events, especially if they were charged with teaching these events and had then done so for some time before, their, uh, before writing. We observe, for instance, broad outlines so all the Gospels are the same in regard to the broad outlines, huh? A general sequence and overview of the period. We see many single, simple incidents, uh, some memorable occasions, anecdotes, things of that sort. We see some sequences. These involve both trivial and major items and the interlinkages between them. We infer, observe forms and rounding off. Uh, by the way, these are more characteristic of oral repetition by one person than of oral transmission through many individuals. The frequent reuse of materials in a traveling ministry uh, would tend to shape striking statements and miracles into this form. A person thinking through and, and learning by experience how telling a story uh, did or did not get the point over and how he was able to get in and out of it and uh, such without lots of words. So that's one of our lessons. The gospel accounts do contain just the sort of material we expect in authentic reminiscences. Secondly, form criticism is hyper-skeptical. If it were applied elsewhere, we would know very little about the past. Some skepticism is helpful, but with too much, you throw out much of what you need. <clears throat> Once we get beyond living people, you must rely on written documents and oral traditions. Films and videos can't be trusted any more than writing. <clears throat> Form criticism, thirdly, has made a positive contribution by showing that we have no tradition in the Gospels of a non-Messianic, non-miraculous, purely human Jesus. If we take the primitive forms before Boltmann throws them out, we still have miracles and Messianic claims. Jesus considered himself able to forgive sin, claims a close relationship with the Father, to be human, but uniquely divine, all of which were noted by the post-Boltmannians. Boltmann must go beyond form criticism with blanket worldview assumptions in order to throw this material out. The Christ of the Gospels continues to be a contradiction to those who have ruled out the supernatural. Well, we're going to turn to redaction criticism here, but let's stop for a moment. Mm -hmm.
This is Dr. Robert C. Newman in his Synoptic Gospels course, lecture number 14 on form criticism.